have not deviated from their previous bands. So it's exactly the same as the previous game. Irelia, Morgana, and Jax. Cloud9 and Clips have adjusted and tried to change their game plan coming into the second match of the series. So now the question is, what do they want first pick? If they lock in Nidalee, they give Rise over to Superhawker. If they lock in Rise, vice versa. Or Superhawker could go for the likes of a Soraka if they really wanted to. Soraka versus Nidalee, it's a gifted mid lane. You can get to that mid game very comfortably because there's very little kill pressure or threat. You talked about it, there is the locked in insta lock. Nidalee, first pick for Cloud9 Eclipse. It's, it's always a risk going with the mid lane at first, but of course, as we saw at the World Championships, it's something that many confident top mid laners can do. And we'll see how it works out for, for Biven who we have been told to pronounce it that way, by the way, if anyone's uh, wondering why we've changed it from Febiven to uh, Forbiven. And the same with Hyanan, where our Swedish is not quite on the uh, par that we would hope it to, but it does mean he is the brain. We are aware of that, but we are seeing the Super Hog Crew locking in Leona and once again, Lucian. So same bottom lane for Super Hog Crew. It also gives you a very good engage strategy. Mixers, Leona play in the previous game was pretty good. Uh, solar Flares, maybe not as on point as you would like, but it didn't matter because they created the zone, they created the threat of connection, and that meant that Cloud9 couldn't engage. So I like the lock-in. It is once again, Mr. Roll's getting a comfortable champion. Uh, Hal Dexter was considering banning it. He was he was taking that that stage or that mindset. So comfortable for Super Hot Crew, scaling champions once again looking like on the side of Clyde 9. They've hovered between a few, and I wouldn't be surprised to actually see Rise being locked in. Ooh, we're waiting for, see whether it does. Was banned out in game one. Thresh already on the table. That was a ban before, and it is gonna get locked in. So, we'll see how Voidal does on Thresh this time around. Karma was not exactly inspiring, I think, in game one. No, it wasn't. Uh, Selfie has the options to run the likes of a Soraka. Nidalee and Rise are gonna take a long time to scale. Soraka's gonna scale so well into the late game. Seeing the Fizz there and noticing LeBlanc has not been banned. Selfie could also run a LeBlanc if you wanted to. If you get some ability power early on, you can run the potential of killing that Nidalee in 1v1 scenarios, assuming Selfie can make it work. Remember, coming into this, he had stats of, I believe, was 11, 11, 26, which is far from being positive. The one thing Super Hot Crew need to be very careful of is not picking champions that get uh, dumpstered in the late game because Nidalee is going to become such a monster. Ryze is going to become such a monster. We see the Dr. Mundo being locked in, which is great. It means he's going to scale and be a good frontline, but he's never going to be as scary as a Ryze because he doesn't offer the same level of damage. So he's not as scary to Hyanan on the back line when he runs in there because he's, it's going to take him so long to actually kill anybody. We'll see how it works out, of course, when Ecton was available, which is what he locked in in the previous game. The fact that Karzix was picked up by Impaler does mean that there's going to be a change in the jungle for Cloud9 Eclipse as well. I'd like to see more ganks from Impaler, I think. Mm. He did he did pretty well in the last game, but of course he was on Xin Sao. He was looking for those stacks towards his Feral Flare and getting his itemization up. As a side note, I think Hyun is probably got the best hair on the stage today. <laughs> just just laying that out there. He did, he did actually say, I hope Reddit uh, re mentions my hair. It's, well, it's, uh... if they don't, I am. Touche <laughs> to you, good man. Uh, and yeah, when you've got Kha'Zix, because you don't need to farm up your Feral Flare, because you don't need to spend as much time in the jungle, you are afforded more opportunities to impact the lanes. If we see an Assassin being locked in for Selfie, which is kind of my instinct, because there is not a massive amount of damage uh, between that Dr. Mundo and, you know, uh, uh, Lucian, yeah, Kha'Zix is going to get up there, but it, it's it's kind of risky. I'd like to see Impaler invading on the Nocturne jungle, trying to get in his face. You've got very good engage. Nocturne onto Rise will be a very scary gank. Rune Prison summoning in place. Nocturne with Nidalee, less so. But again, Centauri is going to be able to engage from very long ranges. Cloud9 have got a good scaling team. And if they ever get to Sieges, I think they're going to do very well. They can keep Super Hawk Crew on the back foot. And Super Hawk Crew got a real problem if they do lock in Fizz of actually getting damage on those tourists. Lucian would be the only one from range to be able to do that. So we'll see. Looks like it will get locked in. But there's that Graves again. We saw it in game one. Hyunan once again running it. And of course the Nocturne, which has really risen to prominence as the uh, one of the main junglers in 4.5. Incredibly powerful. With the Feral Flare, he farms uh, Feral Flare into the likes of a Blade of the Rune King or Hex Drinker. He, has, he becomes a split push threat. Meteos actually won a game 
that Cloud9 were on the brink of losing because he was able to solo the Nexus with enough attack speed and attack damage. So what I like about Cloud9's comp is they've got a jungler that can respond to threats well, which will give him some room for error against Kha'Zix, who's going to be looking to get in, in his face. The thing is, Centaurin has to be quick about it because there is burst damage from Fizz, there is burst damage from Kha'Zix. So as long as Selfie can get ahead, he's going to be in a good position. But Super Hot Crew's comp is very much like Cloud9's comp. They need to be ahead, they need to get kills because they've got very little safe wave clear when the culling's not available. And I'm worried for them under the turrets against a Nidalee who's going to be poking the whole time. Well, considering game one, it was very even in lanes. How do we see this one matching out here? Because no one had a big advantage. It was simply down to rotations and outplays, I guess, by the Super Hot crew. So with that in mind, I actually think it's more even than being in favor of Super Hot crew. And my, my reasoning is that Exactly like you said, it's more difficult for Super Crew to get to towers. It's much more risky. Mm. They can't afford to just move in and, and start hitting towers. They, they need have to, to get kills. They have to it. get kills, or they have to out position and get there first. And when you quickly, who's got good wave clear with his Dustbringer and his AOE, you've got Nidalee spears coming at your face as well. It makes your job much more difficult. So I do think this is a good position, but similar to the last game, if Super Hot Crew don't get hit early, then they could be in trouble. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Game two getting underway in this best of five series. Super Hot Crew, they took game one and are looking very confident. We'll see how it works out for them because this time around, Cloud9 Eclipse will be starting out as the blue team up against the Super Hot Crew on the red team. And in terms of level one, I'm wondering whether we're going to see any rotations. Of course, Cloud9 Eclipse got it invaded. They got themselves that red buff steal as well from Impaler. We'll see how defensive they're going to be this time around. I would almost expect the invades to come from Super Hot Crew, not only because they want to take advantage of the, the uh, slow to power champions like Ryze and Nidalee, but you also want to try and deny Nocturne. If you can steal away big buffs and slow down that Feral Flare and try to prevent him getting to level 6 for a while, it's quite a smart position to be in. So you can see the votes there, Super Hot Crew still. Well, actually, don't say still, it was all about Cloud9 Eclipse yep. before Super Hot Crew. 66% of you have swung your vote, completely changed opinions, jumping on the bandwagon, one might even say. So, Super Hot Crew <laughs> are looking to invade on towards the blue buff area this time around, it seems. So, they're going to be going for the trades. The way the uh, teams are setting up, this is looking like it's going to be a 4v1. It's looking like they're going to go for those early tower pushes. And something that Jet has been talking about excessively in North America is what do the top laner and junglers do once they've got the buffs? Because generally you're going to see the AD carry and support going to the towers and those sort of solo roles looking to either steal more camps away or get to the tower quickly to push it down. And we heard Dexter talking about it as well in the uh, uh, analysis yesterday. We are talking about the, do you go in the second or the third wave? You know, different styles of play. Cloud9 have been going on that second wave. Uh, for the 4 zero, four zero push or 4-0 push, whatever you like to call it. We're just having a quick client restart. You can see in the screens that Mixer is sat there staring at a pause screen, so nothing happening. You're not missing anything right now, staring at the players. Uh, you are, of course, staring at them instead of our beautiful faces, which some would argue is probably a better view. <laughs> Beautiful's a bit of a stretch there. <laughs> 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 I do want to quickly mention, uh, Mixer didn't die previous game. No, that's good. Zero, zero death true. to his name, so... Uh, he did actually have a, a, a fun debate with uh, Voidal. Voidal was saying, I'm going to take your record from you. He said that would be a stretch. It means you need to die over 130 times. I think it is in five games, which Voidal, is, Vo is Vo going for it. He was off to a good start. He was, <laughs> he was off to a good start. <laughs> Started out no, well. No, I, I'm being a little harsh. I, I think um, uh, this time around, assuming lanes go even, I actually prefer Cloud9's composition. I, I really think they scale well. They can have a lot of tools to siege well. Again, not the strongest of wave clear, but Duskbringer, as well as the AoE from Ryze on a short cooldown, as well as Buckshot. And, and you could argue with, with the melee champions, the amount of melee champions they have, with that Thresh, the hooks could be pretty important. The peel that Thresh is going to offer when you're poking with Nidalee is just so valuable, as long as Voidal is hitting his flames and putting his boxes down in the correct place. So here we go, back into the game. Game two underway. Blue steals from both sides this time around, and no Deficio to be seen. It is going to be the Impaler starting out with the blue. 
It'll get to you in a moment, guys. Don't worry. Work on that one. Uh, Mr. Rales, he's going to be in the top lane, and it does seem we are going to have these 4-0 split pushes. We'll see who stacks out and who manages to work out best, because Super Hot Crew were better at rotating in game one. We'll see how Cloud9 Eclipse respond as they move towards their own rotation. So it's actually the Super Hot Crew that are setting themselves up with the buddy system that we talked about. Oro Omni is taking the raid camp solo. He's going to get more experience. You'll notice that Impaler is sitting on the uh, bottom half of the map. Sorry, uh, Centaurin sitting on the bottom half of the map farming as well. Whereas Mimo and Impaler had grouped up to go for the for Larry White and for the Wolf Camp on Cloud9's side of the jungle. Instead of pushing the tower, they've gone back to their own jungle though. So we're not going to see the very fast pushing lane shenanigans that we've got used to. So teleport from Mima as he joins in towards that top lane. Uh, bottom lane, sorry. He's the top laner in the bottom lane. You know what I mean. It's what we call him. He's defending days. his tower. Defending I'm going his with honor, that one. maybe. I don't know. Defending everything. You saw. Uh, in the top lane, it is going to be Mixer and Mr. Raz as, as they shove on in there. Mr. Oduamne. Mr. Mr. Oduamne. Maybe that's his name now. Who knows? He's going to be up against three members of the Super Hot crew who are going to be following this Siege minion in towards the tower themselves. Yeah, I think Oduamne just needs to hang out in the side lane and get experience. That is such a good ward from Mr. Riles, because if Odo Wombat had hung around there, he would have been a threat of being engaged upon. So we are going to see towers being traded, I feel. Kiana's denying as much CS from Mimer as possible. But it's not the hardest of pushes that we've become accustomed to, I think, uh, in the LCS level of play. Once the towers fall, I'm very interested to see, do the teams rotate their AD carries and supports to go straight head to head to defend a tower? Or do they try to continue the push and get another turret? Because that's where things are going to become very interesting. Kianan's left it a little too long there on that wave. I think he wanted to get one extra shot. He was trying to let the minions go down to the tower and then actually miss the last hit, which I don't think is going to be too much of a problem. We can see that Super Hot Crew have kind of done the same thing in the top there, so they're just making sure they try and deny as much experience. Febivan, he's in trouble. Here comes Impaler. Selfie on towards him. Selfie taking the tower hits. He's going to try and... Playful Trickster away from that one, and Forbidden will get away from that one. The Ignite is not enough to kill him. So two, two Summoner Spells used out there by both mid laners. Yeah, so both mid laners going all in. It's not over yet because Impaler is still hanging around in the wings. No mana on Febivin means that he's not going to be able to heal himself up. So Selfie was playing aggressive, and I think he needs to do that. We talked about how the Assassin in the mid lane uh, needs to get kills and needs to be able to roam around the map. Nidalee's not the greatest of wave pushes. Even when she hits six, it's still it's better, but not fantastic, which should allow Selfie some time to move around the map. We see Mixer sticking around in the mid lane. He's got a Febivin! He's managed to get in there. Zenith Blade, there's the stun, there's the exhaust. He's in all sorts of trouble. The kill's going to go to Selfie. There's first blood, and that's going to get him rolling. And this is what we talked about. What do the AD carry and support do once the tower is down? Mr. Rawls went straight to the bottom lane to try and uh, maintain control and not allow the wave to be pushed up further. And Mixer just took a very smart route, hung out in the river, managed to gift that kill over to Selfie playing Fizz. And a good start. You know, Assassin grabbing a kill early on. Let's see what he does with the gold and, and how he continues to play it out. So good start for Super Hot Crew. And it worked out. They got first blood in game one as well. Remember, it was a much closer affair that time around, though. Hyanan keeping that farm rolling in this bottom lane. He has got the duo pairing of Mr. Rales and Mixer now joining him in this bottom lane. But there is a 10 as difference so far. Yeah, I, I think Mr. Rales will be able to pick this one up. The early lane swap tower push has gone in favor of Cloud9 Eclipse, because not only does Hyanan have that small advantage over Mr. Rales, which I think will be even out soon, but Oda one they actually had a pretty good CS lead over Mimer's Mundo as well. So 21 to 13, Impaler's now looking to get more ganks. Remember we said on a champion like Kha'Zix, where he's not responsible for farming as much, we were expecting him to gank more, and it appears as though he's already trying to get in the faces of Cloud9 Eclipse more frequently. And that's actually going to put some fear in Oda Wamne, I feel, there. The fact that he has warded out, he has covered off, and... Now he's putting an element of doubt in Ryze's mind. Of course, he has got that flash available, has got the rune prison, so he has got effectively a free escape the first time around it comes, but if Impaler were to burn that down a second time around, Impaler actually going to find Suntorin in the jungle here. He comes around, Suntorin realizing, hang on a minute, I've got more health than you. I reckon I can turn this fight myself. Oh, Dewamna is now coming down. Impaler in all sorts of trouble. Rune Prison, as I discussed, is a problem. But Impaler has, of course, got that leap. He's not been evolved, but he can still jump over the fences. Manages to get himself out cleaning. I think Impaler needs to be very cautious with his play, 
because you see how quickly Cloud9 Eclipse can respond. He's actually going to jump on Oduamne. This is a fight. He's going to go in there. He's going to have the support of Mimer as well. There's the unseen threat coming in. Then he manages to get the passive through so, so much burst damage down on that taste of fear that Impaler can use. The help of Mimer was close by, and Mimer he's actually gained the farm over Oduamne. He had fell behind, what, 10 CS? All this shenanigans, all the play that's been happening, the doubt that's been put into Oduamne's mind has given the Mimer that advantage. Look at this mid lane, though. Yeah, we'll see if any crowd control can land. It's so difficult to lock up this down. I mean, with his playful trickster as well as his urchin strike, he's got the ability to dash through minions or champions and then hop away. Becomes untargetable. So I'm not expecting anybody to jump on selfie and pick up a kill anytime soon. That looks like recall bait to me, yeah. and it didn't. It, yeah, <laughs> didn't take. That was super obvious recall bait. But you know what? I give you props for trying. Ooh, so. Zenith Blade just flashing past the uh, cape of Hyanan there on his graves. Didn't quite land through. It's going to be Voidle, of course, picking up the. Uh, the, it's not, it was the coin, it was, I can't remember it's turned into now. It's the Relic Shield target brace. Relic Shield, that's the one, which is why he's managing to take the minions. He's not stealing away that gold from his AD carries, actually helping them, both of them out. Selfie, he's going for a roam. He's looking down towards it. It's going to be the blue buff. Pink wards out towards that death buster. So there's one thing I want to highlight, uh, which I haven't mentioned just yet. We touched on how Dr. Mundo is going to scale in a different style to the Rise, as far as your frontline tank is concerned. And while Dr. Mundo is not going to have uh, as much damage, especially in terms of burst, there's no Ignite on the side of Cloud9 Eclipse yeah. at all. So there is going to be very little real kill threat from Cloud9 onto Mimer unless they totally commit. They will have to five-man focus him if they want to get him down, especially when he gets his core items up. Blue buff has respawned. It looks like Impaler wants to go for an invade. This is going to be a little risky. It's two on two. Top laners and jungle is both nearby. Impaler is falling behind in CS because he's spending so much time trying to counter jungle. And truthfully, he's not been super successful at it. Yeah, but Mimer had to push his wave fairly heavily in their favor, which is why the Super Hard crew are putting so much into this. Four members of the Super Hard crew now nearby. They really want to take this one away from Nidalee, which of course will limit those spears and they have managed to lock it down. Impaler walks away with a blue buff. So smart play to deny the blue buff from uh, Forbivens Nidalee, which just means the sieging threat is obviously going to be reduced. He doesn't even have his Athens and Holy Grail completed yet. But the one thing that I do want to point out is that Impaler had just hit level 6 at that fight. Centaurin is level 7, and he's got 20 CS more. Riggle's Lantern is already completed. He's got 14 stacks toward this Feral Flare. So he's on track to equal, if not beat, the Feral Flare upgrade from that Riggle's Lantern. Yeah, we saw how much of a beast a, uh, a very stacked out Nocturne can be just yesterday in that uh, Millennium game. Kotnex played a fantastic Nocturne yesterday, of course. So. I would I would also add that five members of the Super Hot crew moved across that blue buff. They really invested a lot to make sure they got that one. They're going to make sure it counts. Of course, that buff is not going to last too long for Bivin. Actually, they lands the spear on Selfie. A little bit overconfident there. I think Selfie's trying to dodge away from that one and didn't realize how big his hitbox was. Yeah, it's just, just getting caught out. I think highlighting the fact that Super Hot crew invested so many of their members' uh, time into going for that buff steal, is actually something that could come back to bite them. If Cloud9 can, I, I, I use the word loosely, but if they can predict, hey, the next blue boss gonna come up, let's anticipate a steal from Super Hot Crew. And if Cloud9 set up some good vision with wards, you can have Oduwame teleport in, and Centaurin uses Paranoia to come in from a very long range, potentially surprising Super Hot Crew. So we need to keep a very close eye on how Cloud9 deal and attempt to deal with the grouping that's coming out from Super Hot Crew. If you were to look at the stats, ooh, as I tell you that, Selfie's about to go in there. It's going to be dropped it down. That's going to be the Ignite down. The Exhaust counters it. That's going to stop Selfie in his tracks. But those two mid laners going at it just as the Dragon is looking to be started off. Yeah, if Super Hot Crew can get onto the Dragon with the team before Febivin can respond to throw those Javelins out, that's a good place to be. But it uh, doesn't seem to be the case. Voidal. The Great Death Center is just giving vision, so he knows it hasn't been started yet. What I wanted to get back to was the amount of dragons that Super Hot Crew took in the last game. You saw a stat flash down maybe earlier on in the previous matchup. Super Hot Crew have only taken an average of, what, 2.3 dragons, I think, throughout the entire season. They took four, five, six, I think, in the last game. This time around, they've started off well once again. Just shy of 12 minutes, they secure themselves the first dragon of the game. And all thanks to Selfie. Selfie's aggression onto Febivim, forced him away, forced him to recall, and Super Haku just responded. Uh, Impaler stole away the raid camp, 
and then immediately jumped on the objective. So they've got themselves another 2,000 gold lead. We're seeing the same patient and coordinated play, I think, from Super Hot Crew. They grouped up to, to steal the blue buff, they grouped up to secure the dragon. It's hurting them a little bit in CS. I mean, Mr. Rawls is not typically behind anyone in CS, and he is somewhat behind Hyanen. But we'll need to see how this works out because both AD carries have basically just been pushing this bottom wave out and in. They've, they've not truly contributed to the rest of the overall picture. Well, the difference, of course, was when they rotated round. I mean, uh, we saw, obviously, Mr. Riles push down that top wave. He had to go back to base, come down there. Hyanans has pretty much set up a campsite down here. He's got his electricity plugged in, his water's running, and he's, he's ready to just lay in wait in these bushes down the bottom line. He's still got his big wave of minions coming back in once again, and Mr. Rales is ready to counter that and take himself another, what, 12 minions. Yeah, gonna just keep closing that gap. Uh, the longer this goes, I think the slightly happier Cloud9 will be because, of course, Rise and Nocturne and Nidalee are just gonna scale and become very, very good. And, mm. and assuming Cloud9 can, can get to the right targets of Super Hot Crew, they can definitely, definitely pick up kills. But the one thing they need to be careful of is that Mime is now going to lead. He's got the support of Impaler. They're going on rise. Good slow on towards Oduamni there as the briefcase glances the back edge, but uh, not remotely close, unfortunately, this time around. And he did force the flash nonetheless from Oduamni, so that will be classed as a successful gank from Impaler. Yeah, it will be. Now Febivin's caught again. That's going to be the shark thrown out towards him. Just pounces him in the air. The spear's thrown straight back. Selfie, no mana though to really continue that engage. Yeah, had that flash not come out, I actually think there would have been enough burst. The death fire grass went out from Selfie in conjunction with Chumma Waters, and because the E from Fizz didn't connect with Nidalee, he managed to get away. I do think that would have been super, super close. Selfie showing, I, I think, a good mastery of Fizz. He's landed all of the ultimates that we've seen, and he's playing very, very aggressively to try and keep Febivin down. Yeah, I would question why he's not running Fisherman Fizz, though. That's, I mean, because everybody knows that is really the actual only skin you should run. I agree to dis disagree. <laughs> yes. I know you're all about <laughs> the Atlantic one. Atlant Atlantean Fizz is where yep. I'm at. Regardless, let's blue get back buff. to the game. Blue buff, it looks like it's being stolen away. Uh, does this connect with the blue, the big ray. That's a good death sentence. Boyle decides not to follow in. And that's smited away by Centaur. So that's a counter blue steal that came out. Remember how much Super Hot Crew invested in taking away that blue buff. It did go to Santorin though. Didn't go towards Febivin. Febivin actually missed the spear, landing on towards the minion. So again, that's still an elite without a blue. Traditionally, when you do go for those invades, it is the smite steal to secure it. Yes. You, you guarantee you deny that from your enemies. And knowing that the blue buff is uh, respawning, it looks like Cloud9 have got position. Super Hot Crew are nowhere near to challenge for this one. But you'll notice the wards that you've got the pink ward in the river for Cloud9 Eclipse, as well as having the blue buff warded up themselves. Had Super Hot Crew gone for an invade or to try challenge, there would have been more vision for Cloud9 to try and deal with it and, and contest the buff. Centaurians continuing to try and stack out that uh, item. He will not get it just yet. He's almost there. He's at 15 minutes, so he is going to be a little bit behind in Paler was in uh, the previous matchup. However, with them, Blue Wolf secured. Now, and you've got a question, really, when Super Hawk Crew invested so much into getting that first one, whether it was worth it, because they didn't even contest this one this time around. They didn't, and it's going to be interesting to see if they, they try to keep doing it again, because, you know, it's one of those situations where they invaded, it was risky. Uh, they had to commit four members just to steal the blue buff away. And then you think to yourself, what if we do that again and it doesn't go as smoothly? Yeah. What if we commit to that blue buff steal and we lose and we give up kills or something like that? And something that Super Hot Crew did very well in game one was play uh, quite risk-free. And I think that could have been part of the reason they hesitated, part of the reason they didn't go in for that uh, next invade. We do see a number of items coming out from these teams. Oh, here we go, Impaler jumping on it. There's no flash for Oduamne. This time, Mime does use his own flash. Impaler comes in, unseen threat, and takes the field, doing a lot of damage. And it will be Impaler that gets himself the kill, the second of the game. Yeah, just rinse and repeat. The same style of gank, but knowing that flash wasn't available, allowed them to uh, pick up that kill. So the, um, the Feral's Flare has been completed about a minute, a minute and a half later than we've seen from the previous game. But very importantly, Centaurin has got it now, and that gives him just so much more sustain and farming power. He's opted to go for a Giant's Belt as his next itemization, and in contrast to LCS Nocturnes, we actually see Blade of the Ruin King or Hex Drinker being a second item and then going defensive. So uh, Centaurin may be wanting to be more tanky early on, 
might signal dives, might signal more aggressive play. It may signal that he will be using that ultimate to dive in. We haven't seen that ultimate used a great deal just yet, so we'll wait to see whether it does come in. Of course, simply have to be defensive right now. Forbidden with that blue buff in this mid lane. Got that chalice built up a long time ago. We also saw, of course, Selfie. He went with that death by grasp very early on. So we're seeing he really wants to try and stay aggressive, but has been fighting with his own mana issues because he hasn't been getting that blue buff. Yeah, it's so much more difficult to kill Febivin now. Uh, with blue buff and the heals that, that Italy has built in, unless Selfie 100 to zeroes her, she's just going to sustain. Uh, Febivin's just going to sustain through whatever damage comes down and then carry on farming. Fe Selfie had actually built himself up a 20, 25 CS lead maybe three or four minutes ago, and that has just dwindled away thanks to Febivin being able to spam out those, those javelins. We do see that... Voidal may get caught up. Mixer, he's going to go all in. Well, he's going to try and go for it. Solar Flare flashed away from. And they didn't get that big ward after all there either. And that dragon is now up. Santorin is moving into position, but he's a little out of position. This is actually a, a 3 2 split position for Cloud9 Eclipse. Not the ideal spot. But remember that? Solar Flare is down. Yes, so important for Super Hot Crew. I think, in terms of a straight up 5v5, you're going to have a very interesting setup where Selfie is going to be looking to flank, and Febivin never wants to be in the thick of it. He always wants to be throwing those javelins up. This is a straight up 5v5. Solar Flare is uh, only a third of the way off cooldown. So a very important ability for Super Hot Crew, not here. Uh, we may see Super Hot Crew go for a steal. I think that's the only real risk here, or only real option for them. Well, with the way they're grouping up, I'm expecting Mr. Ross to go straight for the call. Then they're going to dive on towards Voidal. A lot of damage going down towards him, but he's not really the ideal target. Now they're going to see them focus in there. Impaler gets in and out, and now they're going to keep that damage going towards it. Oduwamne getting all caught out of the Kulin doing the damage. Mr. Rollins gets himself a second of the game. Yana now going to get focused on. There's the slow coming out from Mime. He's happy to dive the turret. That health regen taken away. Mike's is going to get close. He's got that Zenith Blade ready and waiting to go. As soon as he gets close, he's going to be needed. Mr. Rollins takes a spear, though. That's going to be dangerous. Now they're diving on towards the tower. Santorin's going to be the next focus target. Mix has been caught out by Febivin at the back, but now he's got the support of Mr. Rales coming in there. That's going to be another Mimer taking him down. And that is a 3 for 0 The Dragon also, I think, just went across to support crew. Mundo goes where he pleases because there is no Ignite to shut him down. If you look at the way this engage plays out, the moment Mimer uh, gets into this fight, he's teleported in from the back line. He just tanks up so much damage. And because Cloud9 Eclipse have to get past that very tanky Mundo, it means that the carries are not under threat. Even though they took a big burst of damage early on, they lost key members, and that just allows Supoku to chase. I mean, Mima, he just tanks for days. There was never a threat of him really going down, and very good targeting on the side of Mr. Riles. Yeah, and while that was all happening, you can see, of course, the mid laner, Impaler, and uh, uh, Selfie taking that dragon down, which is what, obviously, managed to secure them. So, three for zero, and the dragon. Big gold swing, straight back into Supoku Crew's favor as it was in game one. They're now six for zero with a 6,000 gold lead. That's a big jump for Super Hot Crew. That was the team fight that Cloud9 Eclipse needed to win or they needed to have given up that dragon. Because they got ran down and because they not only lost the dragon and gave up multiple kills, there is now enough damage on the side of Super Hot Crew with that Fizz and the Kha'Zix to assassinate the fairly squishy-ish champions of Nocturne and Nidalee. In addition to that, Mime has got himself his Spurt Visage. He's got double Giant's Belts. I mean, Mime has just gone full HP because it's going to take such a long time for anybody to burst him down that he just needs HP right now. That's all he needs to build. And he's going to be doing... He's going to survive for so long, he's going to be able to protect his back line. So once again, Super Crew in a very good commanding lead uh, in the mid-game stages. And all the hard work that Hyanan had put in down that bottom lane completely undone. He had got that CS lead, but now the fact there's a 2-0-2 two two Lucian on the opposition team's minions is way ahead in terms of gold, of course, now with that last whisper completed. Mima has rotated around. He's now down this bottom lane, and you can see Oda Wamne in uh, countering that one. But of course, we all know Rise. We all know he needs a while to get going. And the fact is, he isn't building his stacks on that tier while he's out of the lane. He's having to stay very far away from Mima now. Yeah, and the thing is, uh, Cloud9 do have that, you know, that, that late game strategy that'll work out. Mima's just gonna run yeah. Odo on that. Let's see how long it takes to that, kill Ryan. That was straight up disrespect, and Mima's just like, <laughs> I don't think you can do this. He's gonna teleport away from that one, but that is a teleport force to be used. Odo Wamna came up, put the Rune Prison down, put an overload on him, and Mima just thought, are you kidding me right now? You cannot do this, I will walk straight into your face. So because 
nobody can really deal with that uh, Munda. Oh, that's a hook. But no, going in. Because nobody can deal with Mima, he will run you down no matter who you are. And in a 1v1 situation, he's got so much sustained hit points, he will eventually kill you. It'll take a very long time. The thing is, Cloud9 need to stall so badly, they cannot afford to give up more map control or more objectives because they need to buy time for Nocturne, Rise, and Nidalee to get to a point where they can get to that back line and actually kill somebody. We do see the red buff ward coming out from Mima, securing himself and continuing that split portion with that teleport down from Oda one They basically bullied out and the rest of Super Hot Crew can try and push some objectives. It seems that the mid lane turret is going to be the focus. Of course, the outer one was already down, so the inner one is next. The top outer one already down as well. All those three outer turrets all down by the Super Hot Crew. So we'll see when they group up, or they're just going to continue trying to bully out a target. Oduamne has completely switched lanes now. He doesn't want anything to do with Mima. They've left Hyanan to now focus towards him. Let's see how Selfie handles that lane. Uh, because that is a, you know, it's, it's a fairly high hit point. Odo Omni has got a Negatron Cloak to negate some of the burst that's coming down from Selfie. I don't think Selfie can 100 to 0 him instantly, but it will be close. I mean, he's got a lot of ability power, needlessly large rod, plus the Death by Grasp already completed, and Impaler once again invading. Impaler has spent more time in Cloud9's jungle trying to keep Santorin down and trying to deny him as much golden experience as possible. And it, it, it wasn't particularly effective super early on, but now that the map has opened up and Super Hot Crew are roaming together as a, as a team more often, he's in a pretty good position. Yeah, go across, taking down Larry White, and mention to back out of there. Santorin, he stacked out that Feral Flare a long time ago, and he's continuing to grow it as it goes. At the moment, though, he's not really had a big effect. And you know, we were talking about how much he needs to really get involved, how Ko used to get aggressive at the start. You know, he used to help out all of the lanes. I'm trying to think whether we've seen a Paranoia actually come I don't think we have. Lane yet. I was just about to say that, and I know we actually haven't. In the previous Dragon fight, um, that Dragon went down. Now, this is this is super brave. We have to go into the golf voices now because Super Hawker are sneaking the Baron away. They've got so much sustain on Mima. It's Cloud9 and Eclipse have no idea this is happening. This is going to be a, like a super long Baron, but it's, it's so safe because nobody from Cloud9 is responding. Why, why would you expect it at level 12, of course, with this Mundo, with a double giant spell, as you mentioned. He's got so much health. Now the rest of the team will rotate up there. Now it's going to get secured. This is going to be a very early Baron. 25 minutes, just in there. 24 minutes, 30, and easily secured by the Super Hot Crew. Super Hot Crew have grown in their decision-making and their tactical play an immense amount. I would argue, though, is that because they've not been pressured? They would ordinarily be under a lot of pressure, A, from the lane phases, and then B, the rotations. They are being able to basically put their presence onto the game, and Cloud9 really aren't making them make any plays, any, what, any decisions whatsoever. They're just yep. like, well, we're not having anything happen. They're just sitting in lanes, they're playing as you would a solo queue. Cloud9, Cloud9 are playing to not lose, Super Hawker are playing to win. Cloud9 are, are, but it's also the composition, once again. Cloud9 are in a, in a position where their comp needs time, it needs items, and it needs to scale up. So because Cloud9 need this time to get, uh, this time buffer, to get to a power position, it means Super Hawker, yes, are given more freedom in their decision making, and are given more wiggle room in terms of what they want to do. But on the same token, they're making the right choices. Yes, they've got that freedom, they've got that ability to make the calls, but they're doing it. That's the key. Super Hot Crew are actually sneaking the Barons, they're pushing the towers, they're rotating around. And now with Baron up and having, you know, a, a Dr. Mundo that can sit under a tower for 17 years and not die, I'm expecting them to go siege up on his inner turrets and tower dive with Mima just tanking it. As you say, there is the dragon, it is up, and Cloud9 Eclipse nowhere near getting close to this one. With that Baron on the Super Hot Crew, they don't want to get involved in this fight. Wisely will stay away from it, but that's only going to stretch to gold. It's going to be a 10,000 gold deep for the Super Hot Crew. Gigantic in terms of items as well. It's going to get locked in. More importantly, Super Hot Crew are spending that money. We saw Ninjas in Pajamas yesterday sitting on two, 3,000 gold per person when it came to a Dragon fight. And obviously while they had that gigantic gold lead, they weren't making use of it. Super Hot Crew have just all backed. They've all just spent, and they are in full control of this match right now. Yeah, and it's, it's very difficult to see how Cloud9 are going to stall. I think the only way for Cloud9 to really keep themselves in this game would be to turtle and the inhibitor turrets and do their darndest to survive the inevitable dive. 
You know, Mixer and Mime have made it very clear they want to jump in. They want to just keep uh, looking for kills. Ooh. If they can if they can pull a death push. Impaler knows he hasn't been spotted, but if he steps out, he's gonna be in trouble. Look at the rest of Super Hawk crew. They may know Cloud9 are in that bush because it looks like a counterplay, and they're going for the bottom inhibitor turret. There's a ward just to the right of them at the red buff. They knew that they were there. Cloud9 Eclipse wisely step away. It's gonna be the bottom turret. Super Hawk crew once again get themselves that positional advantage. They take another inner turret for themselves without any reply from Cloud9 Eclipse. They are just chasing this game every step of the way. Inner turret secured because Cloud9... Okay, so first of all, Cloud9 didn't want to straight up fight. So they didn't really want to be in a defense situation where they were more likely than not going to lose. So they set up uh, the makings of a death push and they didn't catch anybody out. And look, once again, inner turret being challenged. They've caught Selfie, and that's not even going in, just hops away. Look, Cloud9 really don't want this fight. They're behind in gold, they're against a Baron buff team. They can only defend inhibitor turrets, and even that is going to be hard pressed. More importantly, that Rune Prison, by the time it came down, it was already in playful tricks that got away from it. And then there was a very hard. <laughs> that was the <laughs> ultimate coming out from Hyun in there, trying to steal away those uh, wolves. Uh, that's. I mean, read into what you will, but I think that's a bit of a, a, a desperation play. If, if you're using your collateral damage just to farm wolf camps and deny that from Super Hot Crew, it's a difficult position to be in. Uh, I do want to throw out one of my favorite patch notes from 4.4, and I haven't had the chance to say it yet. You've seen the little patch swirl from the jungle camps? From patch 4.4 and 4.5, there's 100% more swirl on that little buff <laughs> animation. That's how cool that was. Wow. <laughs> you really did go <laughs> depth on those patch notes, didn't you? I'm glad because someone somewhere at Riot had a lot of work to do writing out those notes. So someone's going to be happy with that you right now. That was an awesome note. 100% more swirl. And, you know, swirl's what you need. 6-0, Super Hawk 12,000 gold in the lead. Uh, I'm waiting for the tower dive. And if they don't do it, I'm going to be sorely disappointed because I do feel they are that far ahead and they have a super strong front line that they can get away with it especially considering the mobility of Fizz and Kha'Zix. And with that face of the mountain completed as well by Mixer, they should be piling on there now. With Mimer, of course, you know, he's just like a big tank. He's got this Sunfire Cape completed, the Warden's Mail on there, going to go in towards that Rannian's Omen Void. It'll actually coming around and they are backing away because, well, uh, there is only three members there. I guess that's it's safe. It would have been a five on three. We do see, of course, in the top lane selfie is going to shove that wave down. And it seems the Super Bowl crew are going to play this by the numbers. They're making sure all three lanes are pushed in. They can go full aggression. Yaman a little bit out of position there, but he's pretty safe. They've got vision of everybody on Super Bowl crew. He's still farming fairly well, considering how pressed in Cloud9 have been for the last seven or eight minutes of the game. He's sitting at 260 CS, just, just, just behind Mr. Riles, farming up his jungle camps as well. And he does have a fair amount of damage with that Bloodthirst and Zeal. But the problem is it's going to take way more than that to get through uh, Mima. So even if Cloud9 are able to, you know, burst out, say, Impaler or Selfie or Mr. Riles, all of a sudden Mundo has the cleanup ability because he's just going to out-sustain everybody. So now we're going to get into that situation where we discussed at the very start, they have only got Mr. Rales to hit the turrets. And now they're in there. Well, that answers your question for you. They just walk in there because Cloud9 Eclipse are completely backed away. Well, and that is a dead Oda Omni in the top lane. That is a dead Oda Omni in the top lane. Uh, 100 to 0. I wasn't sure if it could happen. Selfie demonstrated that it could. He does have a Void Staff added in as well. So obviously his damage is going to be amplified. Oh. Selfie wants another. Yeah, Hyunnan's just about to discover oh! the exact same problem. That was awesome! He flashed to land the Playful Trickster and kill Hyunnan. I didn't even think that was going to connect. Well played, Selfie. I like your fist. Yeah, absolutely. That's going to be the uh, bottom inhibitor turret going down. And this is Super Hot Crew in demanding position. A con considerable easy position now. And a 9-0 to zero perfect score so far for the Super Hot Crew. They did let one turret go down, so it's not quite the perfect game for them so far but it has worked out very well in Game 2 so far. That really explains how dominant Super Hot Crew have been in Game 2 when we are calling them out for losing a turret. I know, right? That is, and, and even that was you know, all the way back in the opening second or third minute of the game where Mima teleported from the top lane, was hanging around for a while, and, and you know, it, it was just a, a tactical decision to let that one go down. With the lead Super Hot Crew have built up and with Super Minions in the bottom lane, there is not much Cloud9 can do, barring a monumental mistake from Super Hot Crew. Yeah, we'll have to be a big eat and selfie himself on this Fizz. You know, we questioned him at the very beginning of this series, you know, wondering what he was going to pull out. 
And clearly Cloud9 were thinking the same thing. They focused all three bands in game one towards Selfie, towards that mid lane. I think they were actually expecting him to pull out Oriana because that's what he fell back to during the LCS, during those weeks expecting. when it went out. But he's clearly been changing, cha practicing, working on his new champions in that mid lane, and it's working out well for Super Group. I also want to highlight the fact that he has had two laning phases where he's been under little pressure. Yeah. In game one, yes, he was ganked by Centaur, and of course, they gave up the kill. But Lulu versus LeBlanc, that was a matchup he was comfortable with. You can actually deal with LeBlanc. Similarly now, with Fizz versus Nidalee, he got an early assistance from Impaler, and Selfie was playing aggressive enough to ensure Febivin was on the back foot and never in his face. So Selfie, when he's not playing against the likes of Alex and, and Xpeke and, and people who are going to try and punish and try to get in your face a little bit more, he's really shining. He's stepped up to the plate, and he's playing very, very well. We need to see if this confidence will continue, though, because assuming Superhawk can close this game out, they're one victory away from re-qualifying for the LCS. Remember Super Hot Crew's arduous journey in getting here last time. It was a, a second reprieve, I think it's safe to say. They all went through that rinser. They were 2-0 up themselves against SK Gaming, remember, in that last series. Voidal is going to get destroyed on the spot. Solar Flare does land, but they're not really worried about that. That's going to be the inhibitor going down. And the Super Hot Crew just rolling on through Cloud9 Eclipse's base now. No surprises here. Cloud9 couldn't avoid all that damage, and oh. Selfie and Impaler just melt through. They've got somebody called Joe Miller. All You've just three. Stole his <laughs> They've got all three inhibitors down now and gonna set their sights on the Nexus turrets in the, the not too distant future. Fantastic stuff from the Super Hot crew here now. 10 to 0. Oh to 1, they get it focused on. Selfie goes in once again. We see Impaler flying through the air, but it's going to be Mima that will lock that one down. Febivan, not too sure he's going to try and escape from this one. Santorin hey, is just being drawn away. We did see maybe the first paranoia of the game. I'm not too sure. It's been uh, a little long time coming. But there goes the Nexus down. It's a 13 to 0, ironically mimicking what they did against Gambit Gaming in that 25 minute game. A very quick finisher. It's another 34 minute game for the Super Hot crew. And it is a fantastic second match performance. They are now one game away from re-qualifying for the Summer LCS. Second game in a row, Mixer doesn't give up a death. Second game in a row, Super Hot Crew play very tactically minded. Barring the one blue buff invade in the opening 10 minutes of the game where uh, Super Hot Crew fell behind in CS, they were, again, just in...